Hi, my name is Andy. I'm a scientist working for National Parks in the Sonoran Desert. We study plants and animals, water, soil, and air quality. The reason that we're doing all of this, principally, is to keep track of how parks are doing. And so the analogy that we use is it's like the vital signs in the body. So if you're a, a third grader and you're going to get your physical to see if you can go do sports or you get your annual checkup at the doctor, this is the, sort of the same idea. We're keeping track of, kind of like you keep track of your pulse or, or they'd weigh you or measure how tall you are. We're keeping track of a couple of these key features, these key attributes of these ecosystems to see how they're doing. And if there's a problem, we want to have an early warning. We want to know if something's um, if we need to step in and try and do some sort of management action to correct it um, earlier rather than later. The number one most important thing is water quantity. We're keeping track of how much water is there. It varies between years and it varies over the season. It's affected by things like groundwater pumping or diversions and just climate. Number two is water quality, which is usually things like um, any chemical pollutants. Um, uh, some of those are natural, actually. Some, some of the chemicals that are in the water are actually just because of the geology. We're looking for things that are contamination from biological sources like agriculture, etc. I'm Laura Palacios. I'm a biological science technician for the Sonoran Desert Network. I work in aquatics and physical science. My name is Finjan Freeling. I'm from Germany. I'm a hydrologist. And I'm doing here right now an internship at the Sonoran Desert Network. And I'm mainly working on um, water quality here in several parks in the southwest and I'm interested in emerging contaminants like pesticides and pharmaceuticals. The majority of what I look at is how water quality is being affected over time and so we want to be able to see what we're doing to the water and how it's affecting everything else because everything depends on water. We are also looking at what's in the water. We look at various what we call analytes, so it's going to be things that are dissolved in the water or we also look at um, the oxygen in the water or the pH which is how acidic the water is. Measuring discharge is important because the amount of water is often related to the quality of water. So measuring like discharge like here, the Beaver Creek tells us okay okay the quality of water is good here, there's enough water for the ecosystem, so the main goal of the streams protocol in the parks that have rivers like this um, is to basically test or basically evaluate how well are these systems doing. These are critical places in these parks. These parks are part of our natural heritage. These are biodiversity hotspots. And so we want to understand what's going on with them and seeing if they're changing. Are they staying the same? Are they improving, hopefully, through things that we're trying to do here at the park or off the park? Um, or are conditions actually degrading over time? Is there an issue that we need to do something about? The whole goal of the protocol is to detect those change and understand why. My name is Fraser Watson. I'm a biological science technician uh, with the National Park Service here at Tuzigoot and Montezuma Castle National Monument. Right now we're in Tavashi Marsh and it's a part of Tuzigoot National Monument. Um, so right behind me, where all the cattails are, is standing water, which obviously in Arizona is uh, a commodity. There's not a whole lot of it. And most of the marshes that existed once have since been drained. So the resource we have here is pretty special for uh, the Sonoran Desert. We're out here looking for the Mexican garter snake because uh, it's endangered. It was just listed on the endangered species list um, this past spring. Um, so we know it incur occurs in our park and we want to keep tabs on the population here and see if it's increasing, decreasing, uh, what's going on. The Mexican gar snakes theoretically use the boards as cover from predators and uh, maybe just to cool off uh, if it gets too hot. Even though they are cold-blooded, they can get too hot and they go under the cover boards just for some shade and protection, just to hang out. Uh, it's right next to the marsh itself. So if the snakes are traveling in between the marsh where they forage and uh, right outside the marsh where they hibernate, they come right through this area and use the cover boards. So we just lift up the boards and check to see what's underneath them. Right now there's no snake, unfortunately, um, but we have a lot of boards and we check them every week uh, so that we can catch as many snakes as possible. The reason these Mexican gar snakes are endangered is because they're highly dependent on riparian uh, environments and in the Sonoran Desert those are in short supply 
and they're becoming in even shorter supply because of humans draining wetlands like this or altering uh, stream flows in rivers. Um, so they're already small habitats are getting even smaller. We have uh, several of the parks that we work for are cliff dwelling parks. They're little cultural resources parks that were set aside for uh, a cliff dwelling or uh, you know some other major prehistoric feature. Um, there's a reason people built those things there. Usually it's water. My name is Laura Varen Burkhart and I'm a park ranger here at Montezuma Well. Part of my job is to learn all about the science behind this place and then talk to visitors about that and teach them about what makes this place special. Montezuma Well is a geological formation. It's also an archaeological site because the Native Americans that lived here, we call them the Sanawa, they built homes inside the walls and also around the rim of Montezuma Well. And they lived here from about 1050 to 1420. And they used the water from Montezuma Well. They caught that, all that water that leaks out into an irrigation system, and they used the water to irrigate or to water all of their crops. So what makes the Sonoran Desert so special is truly its, its biodiversity. So you, you may not think of the river behind me as being part of a desert when you think of the word desert, but it is. It's a really important part of that desert. So it's everything from, from mountaintops covered in conifer trees and black bears to saguaro cacti in these giant wide valleys, river corridors, and sort of everything in between. It's biodiversity, and we don't mean just the number of species, but the wide variety of kinds of species and life that's out there. It's all occurring in a relatively small area, that in the same day, you could drive your car and see alpine, areas above tree line, and you could drive down and see, see desert, see saguaro cacti. When I first came here, uh, I probably thought what everyone thought, that it was a desert and very barren, desolate, and didn't seem like there was a lot going on. Uh, but the more time I spent here, the uh, more I realized that it's an extremely diverse place biologically. There are certain animals that live in this very unique water that you only find here. You can't find them anywhere else in the world. And so it's really fun and it's really interesting to study things that you, you can't find anywhere else. This area is so unique, um, desert as a whole, because it's so well adapted to not having the water and then the areas that I get to go are unique because they have it. The population of the earth is growing exponentially so more and more people need water and that's why um, yeah research on water on this pristine resource is extremely important. What we're hoping the next generation takes away from the work that we're doing is understanding uh, about the natural world and understanding the natural world in their national parks, places that they can come and visit. Understand how these things work, some of the surprising things that maybe we thought it worked, things weren't worked a certain way and we're always constantly finding out that maybe we don't have exactly the right answer. And so there's always this new kind of creative curiosity piece to doing science. And it's my hope that the next generation both learns to enjoy and embrace science, but using science as a way to connect them to these places. Um, to these uh, national parks and their resources um, that are our national heritage and that we all want to protect. You're not going to protect someplace unless you love it.